Okay, so let us continue uh, our discussion. So, if you remember that uh, in the last class, I uh, tried to wind up this discussion of uh, dynamical symmetries and uh, the importance of this Runge lens vector. So, basically I showed that this uh, if you recall uh, this Runge lens vector is defined in this peculiar way that is defined as um, the linear momentum cross product with angular momentum and you subtract out the um, scalar term in the direction of uh, r hat which is r hat is the direction connecting the origin to the mass that is uh, going round and round the origin. So, this k is basically the constant that appears in the force. So, so we assume an inverse square force and the strength of that force is k. So, there is an inverse square attractive force and the strength of the force is k. So, it is k by r squared. So, that is the k there. So, this is the Runge lens vector which uh, I just showed in the last uh, lecture that it is conserved by explicitly evaluating the derivative with respect to time and then you are able to show that it is conserved. So, um, I repeatedly pointed out in the last uh, lecture that uh, the Runge lens vector is independent of the angular momentum. That is of course true for the large part, but I have to qualify that with uh, the following statement that uh, while its uh, direction is independent of, in fact not only independent, it is actually perpendicular, the direction of A is perpendicular to the direction of L. And why is that? Because uh, you take a dot product of A and L, you will see that uh, P cross L dot L is 0 but then uh, you will be left with the other term which is minus m k r cap dot l. But remember that r cap is, uh, is the unit vector connecting the uh, origin to the mass and then that is in the orbit of the motion of the planet or whatever you are talking about. So, it is in the orbit and the angular momentum is by definition the uh, vector which is perpendicular to that orbit. So, therefore, that is also 0. So, as a result uh, the A vector by construction is perpendicular to the L vector. So, therefore, A and L are independent in the sense of directions. So, they are they are mutually perpendicular. However, the magnitude of L is actually uh, already. So, the direction of A is a new conserved quantity, but the magnitude of A is not a new conserved quantity. So, the magnitude of A is uh, relatable to conserved quantities that we have already encountered namely the angular momentum and the energy and the uh, way you write this is uh, A squared is uh, you can show that A squared is going to come out as m squared k squared plus 2 m e l squared where e is the total energy of the system which is constant, l squared is the square of the angular momentum which is constant m and k are anyway constants. So, and m and k are constant. So, the rest of it is. So, as a result a squared is a constant and it is a constant that we have already encountered before in the sense that it is related to constants that we already know this. It is not a new constant. So, the new constant really is the direction of a. It is the direction of a that is a new constant. So, uh, so, as a result you see that is the reason why in the last class I defined this peculiar uh, quantity called alpha as the tan inverse of A y by A x. So, what that is is basically it tells you the orientation of A. So, that means A vector is perpendicular to L. So, therefore, it is in the orbit of the planet. So, it is parallel to the orbit of the planet. So, basically A points in some particular direction on the orbit of the planet that means parallel to the orbit of the planet. So, what you do is that you, uh, you define the orientation of A relative to some chosen axis like x and y and uh, you define the angle made by the A vector with the x axis as your alpha. So, if that is the case then uh, then you see then tan inverse A y by A x is going to be your alpha clearly because uh, A x will be A cos alpha and A y will be A sin alpha and uh, alpha is therefore tan inverse A y by A x. 
So, that basically, uh, so the alpha is the new conserved quantity which specifies the direction of A because the magnitude of A was already related to uh, earlier constants namely total energy and angular momentum. So, uh, so that is exactly what we, uh, we picked alpha as the generator of this new symmetry called dynamical symmetry. So, if you pick alpha as your generator then you will be able to show that so, the symmetry generated by alpha is the symmetry that is responsible for the conservation of the Laplace Runge length vector, especially its direction. The magnitude is already conserved for other reasons. So, that is uh, basically the long answer to the question uh, what is the symmetry that is responsible for the conservation of the Laplace Runge length vector? So, that is a new conserved quantity which is only present for inverse square attraction central force, okay, it is not there if it is central force of any other kind. Okay, so, that was the missing part of my discussion so which I have completed. So, now I am going to discuss uh, the symmetries in field theories and uh, specifically try to see if I can use Noether's theorem to write down conserved quantities in field theories. So, if you recall that I told you that every uh, dynamical equation can be thought of as some kind of an Euler Lagrange equation of a suitable Lagrangian. So, for example, if you think of a wave equation, so obviously a wave equation should also therefore be imagined or should be you should be able to imagine the wave equation as the Euler Lagrange equation of some suitable Lagrangian. In fact, you will see that the suitable Lagrangian is like this, this, I think we have encountered this before. So, so I will start from here. So, this is your Lagrangian whose Euler Lagrange equations are the wave equation. So, now I am going to identify a certain symmetry uh, associated with uh, this Lagrangian and that is a continuous symmetry. So, notice that I, in order for me to derive conserved quantities using Noether's theorem, I should ensure that uh, the symmetries are continuous that means that it should not be a discrete symmetry like a reflection symmetry or that sort of thing. So, it has to be some continuous symmetry. So, this is an example that uh, so, so I am going to first postulate a transformation that imagine that the original theta of x comma t is now replaced by theta subscript s which is basically obtained by shifting x with uh, or replacing x with x plus s. So, now you can see that when you do that your Lagrangian is unchanged. So, the theta itself changes. So, theta changes from theta of x comma t to a theta of x plus s comma t. So, theta changes, but the Lagrangian does not. So, now uh, clearly since s is continuous uh, Noether uh, guarantees that there is a conserved quantity and what is that conserved quantity? It is precisely this. So, notice that uh, because it is a field theory, I am summing over x. So, it, x takes on, so in, in the case of say finite number of particles, this x would be your q i, it is the number of generalized coordinates q 1, q 2, q 3 like that. So, now you have infinitely many generalized coordinates. So, labeled by x, x is a continuously infinite number of generalized coordinates. So, theta of x, theta of x dash, they are all different, different generalized coordinates, but then x is continuous. So, all you have to do is ra rather than summing over those q i's, you have to integrate over x. So, then you see that uh, what Noether says that this is conserved. So, now let us calculate this uh, generalized momentum as it were and you will see that it is basically this. Okay. So, now you can easily convince yourself that this is a conserved quantity. Okay. So, how do you convince yourself of this? So, just uh, uh, take the time derivative of q with respect to time and you will see that is in fact conserved. So, if I take the time derivative, you will see that uh, I have to first differentiate q with respect to time first here then I have to second I have to differentiate this. So, first here then second here. So, but then you see um, this is nothing but the wave equation tells me that this is nothing but uh, c squared d squared theta by d x squared. So, that c squared and c squared cancel and I get this. But now you see this term 
can be written like this ok. So, this is just a square of one half of square of this. So, similarly this also can be written like this. So, basically you can write both these terms as the spatial derivative of some function ok. So, this can be written like this, this can be written like this, but then you see when once you do that uh, the derivative uh, the integral of a derivative is what you will get. So, that means the value of the function at plus and minus infinity which we assume is 0, we have, we have to assume that these functions vanish rapidly at infinity. So, if that is the case then these terms are actually 0 ok. So, you see that therefore, this is conserved quantity. So, that means q is a conserved quantity as guaranteed by Noether ok. So, this is an example of a conserved quantity in field theory. So, the next example we can think of uh, is so that was in one dimension. Uh, so, I want to move to uh, dependence on so that index x remember that x takes on the well role of an index. So, what was like a q i the number of generalized coordinate was specified by that index i now it is specified by this x. So, you see the point is that uh, this index x is now continuous and not only it is continuous and now it is in three dimensions. So, if that is the case then in addition to the what I had done earlier that is uh, ability to translate uh, x to x plus x now I can do something even more interesting namely I can uh, rotate x to x dash where x dash is some orthogonal transformation starting from x right. So, I can rotate that vector to some other vector. So, that is what I have done here. So, uh, I have said that uh, let my continuous transformation be this rather than say x to x, pl x plus s that was the example I had already discussed earlier. So, I want to discuss a different example. So, where I replace x by as the rotated version of x which is uh, m s into x. So, the m subscript s is an orthogonal matrix ok. So, now this orthogonal matrix you can see the clearly that uh, but, uh, the earlier case it was obvious that the Lagrange is unchanged under this uh, transformation. So, therefore, it is a symmetry, but here it is less obvious. So, let us uh, work it out. So, you see if I replace x by m s into x you see I, I can do a change of variables call this y. Then the thing I have to do is I have to. So, this will of course, become some orthogonal matrix into inverse into y grad y into inverse of an orthogonal matrix, but then I am squaring it. So, that uh, that goes away right. So, the so square will be involve the transpose and that sort of thing. So, m, m transpose m will come which is identity, but the only thing I have to make sure is this. So, this because uh, x uh, x going to y is uh, an uh, orthogonal transformation the Jacobian is unity ok. So, because of that uh, the uh, volume elements are the same right. So, because uh, they are the same, uh, so that is what I have shown here. So, if this m s comes out, but then it is its square is uh, anyway 1. I mean square means like trans m transpose m is 1 that is what you will get. So, if so if I uh, m v squared is basically v transpose m transpose m v which is basically v transpose v. So, so that goes away the m goes away. So, bottom line is that this transformation is in fact a symmetry. So, uh, so because it is a symmetry uh, Noether again guarantees that there is a conserved quantity and what is that conserved quantity? It is precisely this it is the by now you have probably already memorized this. So, it is uh, the rate of change of the generalized coordinate with respect to that continuous symmetry parameter called s and then the generalized momentum multiplied by generalized momentum and then I have to sum over all the degrees of uh, freedom. That means, that I have to sum over all the x values which uh, like I have repeatedly said it takes on the role of uh, an index which counts how many degrees of freedom there are which is a continuously infinity of them. So, bottom line is that uh, this is what Noether tells you that because this is a symmetry this is a conserved quantity. So, you can see how powerful this theorem is that it would have been impossible for you to guess this conserved quantity, 
but however it is extremely simple and natural for you to guess the symmetry. You can see that this, uh, this symmetry that you take x and you rotate it and your Lagrangian does not change is a fairly obvious thing just by visual inspection you can easily see that that is a symmetry. So, that is why I have repeatedly told you that humans can uh, spot symmetries in all kinds of places uh, uh, whether it is a visual symmetry, auditory symmetry, all kinds of uh, sensory organs can spot all kinds of symmetries. But however, no sensory organs can pick up a conserved quantity that easily. So, what uh, Noether's theorem allows you to do is uh, once you have spotted the symmetry, it immediately implies a conserved quantity and that is the real uh, power of this technique. So, therefore, Q is a conserved quantity. So, uh, so let us proceed further and evaluate Q explicitly. Now, you will see that uh, this the generalized momentum in this context is basically uh, the rate of change of this theta variable with respect to time. So, this is easy and this just comes from the Lagrangian, but what is not so easy is this. So, I have to evaluate the rate of change of the uh, variable in question with respect to this flow parameter. So, remember that theta s is defined like this, it is the replacing of uh, the original theta x with m s into x. So, that gives you a new theta called theta subscript s. So, now the derivative of this new thing with respect to s is going to look like this, this times this. Okay. So, now um, I evaluate this and then of course, I specialize to s equal to 0 because I have told you earlier that uh, finally, it does not matter what that s is because uh, it is going to be independent of s. Okay. Finally, q is independent of s. So, I, I might as well call s equal to 0 as what I am looking for. So, now specifically, so uh, so, I have reduced the calculation of this to uh, something simpler namely this. So, I have to evaluate uh, such a quantity. So, now you see how do you do this. So, specifically let us, uh, you cannot do it in general if you do not know what sort of rotations you are talking about. So, now let us specifically focus on rotations that correspond to rotating about the z axis by some angle called s. So, in that case this matrix m is going to look like this. Okay. So, uh, so, if m is like that, then you can see that it is clearly, right. So, uh, this much is what I have written there. So, this much can be written in this way. Okay. So, there is a d, dm by ds evaluated at s equal to 0 is going to be like this. And uh, there is the gradient there. So, now, you, when you do this calculation, you will see that it is this into this. Okay. So, now this is a conserved quantity uh, corresponding to uh, this rotating x by some amount okay. that is what uh, Noether guarantees. So, now the question is uh, uh, it looks complicated. So, it is not very obvious that it is a conserved quantity just so if you are the kind of suspicious kind and you are not convinced. Uh, so, uh, then you can just go ahead and take the rate of change of q with respect to time and you will uh, be able to show and convince yourself that is uh, in fact 0. So, therefore, q is conserved. So, since we are somewhat suspicious because this looks uh, complicated, let us go ahead and find explicitly the rate of change of q. So, if I do that, I have to do this, then I have to do the second derivative here, but then the second derivative is because it theta weighs the wave equation it is this and like I told you if you have d by d theta squared right. So, that is what this is. So, you will have a d by d theta squared right. So, now uh, bottom line is so, the first term is 0 because you see uh, you are you are supposed to integrate over uh, x y n. So, you are integrating over a volume. So, x, y and z are independent. So, suppose I fix y and decide to integrate over x. Okay. So, this term is going, this are derivative with respect to x and I am integrating because this is going to be dx dy dz. So, if I fix uh, y uh, and try to integrate x, then I will be uh, 
forced to um, I mean fix by means like I want to integrate y and z later. So, I want to integrate x first if I decide to integrate x first then I will be integrating the derivative of something with respect to x, x. So, derivative with respect to x integral with respect to x. So, the 2 will cancel out and you will get this function evaluated of course, this is over all space. So, uh, so like I have repeatedly told you all these functions vanish rapidly at uh, infinity at all, all in all the boundaries of the R 3 basically the space of all points. So, in which case this, this, this is basically a boundary term which goes away this is a boundary term that goes away and uh, so, it is only the second term which will uh, remain ok. So, to evaluate the second term, so you will have to spend some effort you will have to explicitly write this as a d squared by d x squared plus d squared by d y squared plus d squared by d z squared ok. Because this is Cartesian this is y and all that so better work in Cartesian. So, it is going to be a d squared by x d squared d, d z squared. So, then you will see that each of these terms can be split up like this you can write this as a, a derivative of the square then this itself is derivative and derivative like this. So, this is 0 for reasons that I have already told you ok. So, the middle term you can simplify so this is less obvious right. So, why this is uh, 0. So, you, you have to uh, split the you, you do this integration by parts type of thing right. So, you can you can throw this derivative on this side right and then you throw the derivative of this on that side. So, you you will get uh, this term. So, this is just integration by parts ok. So, the bottom line is that these these terms together with these terms will cancel out. So, they will they will cancel out in uh, in pairs. So, you will you can just see that from uh, from these calculations ok. So, so you will see that they cancel out in pairs because it is hard for me to verbally explain things here there are a lot of things going on here. So, there are lots of terms and they all cancel out in pairs bottom line. So, eventually you will end up with this result. So, that finally, the, they all pair up and cancel out and then towards the end you will be left with two terms which also finally cancel out. So, bottom line is that with some effort you can show that uh, this uh, q is a conserved quantity because if you explicitly evaluate the derivative you get 0 ok. Ok, so uh, last example uh, till now what we have done uh, symmetry means we have uh, so that is the thing about field theories. So, there is no uh, there is no rule that you should only uh, continuously modify x or anything you can continuously modify anything so long as it is a continuous transformation which leaves the Lagrangian invariant. So, we chose to uh, rotate x, uh, we chose to translate x, but now uh, we uh, we remain we did not touch theta because it earlier it was a scalar, but now I have generalized this concept to a vector uh, dependence on on the theta. So, instead of theta I have a vector dependence. So, your Lagrangian is a function of a vector field rather than a scalar field right, it is a functional of a vector field. So, if that is the case then uh, that uh, it affords a different transformation uh, in addition to what we could we can still do what we did earlier we can take x and replace x by x plus some constant vector uh, we will of course, get back the same conserved quantity, but we can also uh, take x and rotate it we will get back this uh, similar conserved quantity, but now uh, in addition to that. Uh, we can do something else when that instead of theta being a scalar if that theta was replaced by a which is a vector then you can do something more interesting that instead of rotating x you can rotate a itself. So, that is what I have done here. So, I rotate a then clearly this is uh, even more obvious that it is a symmetry that means it leaves the Lagrangian invariant. So, if that is the case then you see immediately we write down the conserved quantity as usual and then you will see that uh, this this basically amounts to something similar to angular momentum. So, this is like a uh, x and this is like a p or like this is an r and this is a p 
So, this is your generalized coordinate. Notice that this A is your generalized coordinate, x is like R i. So, R i cross P i summed over i. So, it has that, that flavor. So, this is velocity, but basically time rate of change of R i is proportional to momentum. So, something like angular momentum. So, that is hardly surprising because what, what this corresponds to is the rotation of uh, the A vector continuously. So, uh, so if the Lagrangian is invariant, there should be something analogous to angular momentum which is conserved, which is what that is. Okay, so, that is nice to know. So, uh, I have shown some uh, examples where, so, it just, so, the point is that while continuous symmetry is always guarantee conservation loss. Uh, but discrete symmetries do not always guarantee it, but then you can concoct peculiar examples where in fact a discrete symmetry uh, does mean some conservation law. So, I do not want to spend too much time on that. So, now I want to start a different uh, chapter namely, uh, so till now what I have done is basically I have introduced the concept of a field. So, that means remember what a field is. So, you have to first remember what a dynamical system is. So, a dynamical system has some degrees of freedom which we call generalized coordinates and uh, they are function of time. So, you can write down a Lagrangian which is a function of the uh, coordinates and the rate their rates of change. So, that will uh, lead to uh, some dynamical loss of motion. So, these generalized coordinates are finite in number typically when you encounter them, but in field theory what we do is we uh, generalize this idea to infinitely many uh, generalized coordinates. So, instead of having q 1, q 2, q 3, we are now have a q uh, bracket some x, where x is now continuous. So, that x is not position, but it basically takes on the role of i, where i is 1, 2, 3. Now, x is continuously changing from whatever to whatever. So, uh, that is basically the idea behind a field theory that is you are replacing uh, generalized coordinates by their continuously varying counterparts. Okay, so, uh, having done that, we then were able to show that uh, these sorts of continuously infinitely many degrees of freedom allows us many possibilities. So, it allows us to do uh, continuous transformations that leave uh, Lagrangian in, uh, invariant in various ways. So, uh, when uh, Lagrangians are invariant under continuous symmetries, Noether's theorem guarantees conservation, uh, conservation loss. So, it guarantees that there are quantities that are independent of time. So, uh, so, basically we have succeeded in listing a plethora of uh, conserved quantities which correspond to uh, these uh, continuous symmetries, which are far more numerous in the context of field theories than in the context of systems with finite number of degrees of freedom, simply because uh, of the really huge number of ways in which you can implement these transformations when you have all these uh, infinitely many degrees of freedom. So, that we had stopped right there. So, now I want to discuss a new chapter which is of course, uh, more practical, but it is going to use the pretty much the same ideas that I had started off with namely that I am going to identify the electric and magnetic fields in the Maxwell's equation as a field, a dynamical field. So, that means that you have instead of finite number of degrees of freedom, you have infinitely many degrees of freedom. Then I am going to show that uh, the Maxwell's equation which are the dynamical equations of the electromagnetic field can be actually thought of as the Euler Lagrange equation of a suitable Lagrangian. So, I am going to identify generalized coordinates, generalized momenta. So, that will lead to the Euler Lagrange equation which are precisely the Maxwell equations. Okay, so, um, so that is I am going to do that towards the end, then I am going to use symmetries and write down conserved quantities and so on. Before I do that, I want to explain to you uh, what the electromagnetic uh, theory looks like and uh, specifically the relativistic nature of the electromagnetic field. So, many students uh, kind of uh, 
do not really understand this uh, uh, why it is that Maxwell's equations are said to be consistent with special relativity, but not with Galilean relativity. So, that is repeatedly pointed out, but not properly explained in many books. And uh, of course, even when they explain it, uh, many books start with a four vector notation and make the whole proof so compact and that it becomes uh, very opaque and students simply do not understand that it, it feels like magic because the four vector notation makes uh, every statement so incredibly compact that it is hard to see what assumptions have gone into the proof and it, basically you would not be able to see the proof working out in all the steps and details because many of the steps are swallowed up by the four vector notation. So, the advantage of the four vector notation it makes proofs very quick. So, the brevity is a very big advantage, but it is also a disadvantage in this for a beginner because uh, they feel intimidated by the brevity. Uh, it seems a bit too quick for most students. So, just to avoid that I have decided to explicitly uh, list out the steps involved in proving that Maxwell's equations are consistent with special relativity rather than Galilean relativity by expanding it out in components and looking at boosts along the x direction as it is customary in special relativity. Okay, so, uh, so when I do that you see, uh, so to do that first I have to remind you what Maxwell's equations are all about. So you see in Maxwell's theory you have sources uh, of electromagnetic field which are basically the charge density and current densities. Uh, so, these sources uh, lead to uh, or they generate the electromagnetic field. So, the idea is that these uh, charge densities and current densities obey uh, a, what is called a continuity equation that guarantees that the electric charge in any volume is, uh, is conserved. So, that means that uh, so, if the total electric charge is increasing or decreasing in a volume, it is mainly because or it is only because the current is either flowing in or out. Uh, so, so, if no current is flowing in or out, uh, the uh, continuity equation uh, guarantees that the total charge in that volume is fixed. So, it would not spontaneously appear out of nowhere or suddenly disappear on its own. So, this is the conservation of electric charge. What I am going to show you now is that I can think of uh, this collection of four properties of the charge distribution as a relativistic four vector. So, I am going to collect uh, these uh, quantities in this form. So, I am going to define a vector, I mean basically a four vector. Okay, it's not right now. It's not clear that it is a four vector in the relativistic sense, but but I'm going to prove it. But I'm just going to collect them in the form of a you know ordered collection of four objects. So the first one is the density of I mean the electric charge density. The second is the x component of the current density, the y component of this current density, the third uh, component in this uh, ordered collection of four objects. And then lastly it is the z component of the current density. So, I have these three quantities. Now, I, I want to show you that uh, these uh, quantities obey under a boost. So, if I boost uh, you know what a boost is basically I move to a reference frame where I travel relative to the original reference frame in the x direction with some velocity v. So, that is called a boost in the x direction. So, what I am going to show you is that when I do that and I uh, measure the electric uh, I mean uh, the charge density and the current density in the moving frame that is going to be rho r, uh, rho dash and j dash that is going to uh, be related to rho and j in this uh, very interesting fashion which is very reminiscent of the original Lorentz transformation involving space time coordinates. Okay, so, how do I prove this? Okay. So, to prove that I first start with uh, uh, the continuity equation. So, if you recall 
the continuity equation says that uh, the rate of change of the charge density is basically the negative divergence of the current. So, we, what that means is that basically if charge density is in, uh, increasing that is because current is uh, converging into the into that region right. So, conversely if the charge density is decreasing with time it is be, because current is diverging out of that region ok. So, that is what uh, continuity equation says. So, now I am going to uh, ask myself so the, the question the fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves is that which transformation of rho and j leaves this invariant that means that uh, I want this continuity equation to have the same form in all reference frames. So, so I if I replace rho by rho dash t by t dash uh, r vector by r vector dash j j vector by j vector dash I should get back the uh, same continuity equation. So, the question is which is that transformation which does that. So, but for space time coordinates we know what that is and that is the Lorentz transformation. But for rho and j it is certainly not obvious that it is uh, I mean so that is what we want to find. So, how should rho and j transform? So, is there a simple way in which rho and j transform so that the um, continuity equation looks the same and you will see that in fact there is and the way to do that is you replace rho dash by a linear combination of rho and x. So, so you see this is a reminiscent of uh, the rho j x j y j z. So, this is time this is x this is y this is z ok. So, the time corresponds to charge density x corresponds to so this is as far as transformations are concerned. So, rho j x transforms the same way as t and x transform. So, t t becomes t dash x becomes x dash under Lorentz transformation and the exact uh, you know you know exactly how x dash depends on x and t under Lorentz transformation. So, in fact, rho dash uh, uh, j x dash will depend in exactly the same way on uh, j x and rho just as uh, x dash depended on x and t in some particular way. So, in fact, that is what we are going to prove now that is not obvious at this stage. So, in order to prove that first we am going to postulate that because all these equations are linear obviously the transformed uh, quantities had better be linear because if they are not it is at the outset uh, clear that the whole thing is inconsistent. So, in linearity is a must because it was linear in one reference frame it has to be linear in the other reference frame because otherwise the, the equations do not look the same. Bottom line is that if you assume linearity then you will see that uh, you can always rewrite this in, uh, as linear combinations of so rho and x ok. So, you see this will involve derivative with respect to time and time uh, in the new reference frame will get replaced by t dash and rho will get replaced by rho dash. So, you see uh, now we know how uh, derivative with respect to time in the new reference frame will look like uh, with respect to the derivative with respect to time in the old reference frame and the spatial derivative. So, remember that x 0 is c t and uh, oh well I have, I have said t itself. So, x 0 is t and x 1 is uh, yeah the so superscript is basically t x y z the subscript is uh, so these are the contravariant and covariant forms. So, I am using the four vector notation only in the context of uh, trying to relate to special relativity because you already know four vectors and how the spatial coordinates transform. So, uh, with respect to the electric uh, magnetic field in currents and densities it is not clear that they are four vectors. So, that is what we are trying to prove that there in fact are four vectors in the sense in which uh, you know time and position form a four vector. So, uh, so in order to do this we have to transform to the new reference frame and then you will see that it is uh, the derivative with respect to time in the new reference frame is writable with uh, in terms of the derivative with respect to uh, time in the old reference frame and the spatial derivative with respect to old reference. So, uh, same with the spatial derivative with respect to 
the old reference, uh, I mean, uh, so spa same as spatial derivative. So, this was time derivative in new reference frame, spatial derivative in the new reference frame. So, now you go ahead and demand that this equation should be the same with just all the quantities replaced by primes. So, T gets replaced by T prime, rho gets replaced by rho prime, grad gets replaced by grad prime and so on. So, when you do that and you go ahead and substitute this here, you will see that, uh, so this is uh, these constants or these coefficients, so what I, I do not know and trying to evaluate. So, I replace that by this and then I demand that uh, this looks the same uh, in, so this, this should look like this. So, because this is 0, this is also 0, okay. So, then this will immediately lead to these equations, okay. And then when I solve them, I get this, these answers, okay. And this is precisely uh, telling you that uh, the, uh, so basically you will arrive at this. So, rho dash, so rho dash transforms exactly how T would have transformed. So, you see how does T transform? It is gamma T minus P by C squared into X. So, this is like T dash, this is like T, this is V by C squared, this is J X is like X. So, similarly here x dash is gamma x minus v t. So, it is v t, okay. So, they transform the same way. So, therefore, a rho j x j y uh, j z are 4 vectors. So, in the next class, I am going to stop here because uh, in the next class, I am going to show that not only the continuity equations transform in a simple way. Uh, and in fact, uh, they are so simple that they are identical to uh, the position and time for, uh, for vector. But then the, uh, there are other quantities in Maxwell's theory, namely it is not just the density, charge density and current density, the other quantities are basically the electric and magnetic fields. So, it is a perfectly good question to ask how do they transform under Lorentz transformation. So, for that you will see that they transform in a certain way which corresponds to actually uh, basically a tensor. But uh, I do not necessarily have to speak in that language, I will uh, explicitly tell you how the components of the electric field transform and how the magnetic field transforms and uh, they do not look uh, too similar to position and time transformations but they are still sufficiently similar that you will be able to see a pattern there. That also shows the relativistic nature. So, that basically uh, completes the description or the proof that uh, the electromagnetic fields are in fact consistent with Lorentz transformations rather than Galilean transformation, okay. So, because uh, anything which is consistent with Lorentz transformation is certainly not consistent with Galilean transformation because in Lorentz transformation speed of light is unchanged in Galilean transformation it is not. So, the moment was some set of equations is consistent with Lorentz transformation, it or it is automatically the case that they are not consistent with Galilean transformation. So, I am going to leave that for the next class. So, I am going to show you, I sh just showed you how the current density and charge density transform under Lorentz transformation. So, the remaining parts of the Maxwell equations involve the electric and magnetic field vectors. And I am going to show you how the components of those vectors transform under Lorentz transformation. So, that is for the next class. So, I hope to join you in the next class and then after that I will start talking about other subjects, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.